chapter number five. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Romans chapter number five and beginning at verse number six. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter number five, beginning at verse number six. It says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So even when we was out in sin, right? He died for us. And for scarcely for a righteous man, one uh, will die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Man, I love that verse. Can we read it again? But God commendeth his love. That means just over and beyond. He commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be loved by you. Lord, sometimes we don't feel very loved. Sometimes we feel rejected in the world in which we live sometimes. But uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you'll always love us. We thank you, Lord, that you're always glad to hear from us, always glad to see us. And Father, I just ask that you would anoint my voice, anoint my mind, anoint my spirit to be able to bring forth this word in a way, Lord, that is pleasing to you and in a way that your people, your Lord, your children need to hear it. Father, we ask for your anointing in Jesus' name. And God said, amen. amen and amen. Hallelujah. Tonight we're opening a series that I may mention of this morning called Labels. I understand there's a lot of labels out there. A lot of labels in the world. We're living in a world and in a time where people have a lot of labels that they assign to others. We've grown up with labels placed on us uh, here and there throughout our lifetime. And uh, people assign these labels sometimes to themselves, even as well. How many know sometimes we swallow hook, line, and sinker? What the devil has. You're this, or you're that, or you're not this, or you're not that. And, and so we, uh, you know, it's kind of like somebody telling you, uh, you don't look so good. And you say, well, I don't feel bad. Yeah, but you're, you're a little ashy looking. And, you know, and somebody keep on, and, of course, they're like, boy, I don't feel so hot. <laughs> well, my stomach is kind of a little bit funny feeling. And, and so, you know, a lot of times we assign things to ourselves. We believe the lies of the enemy. We believe what we're being told. Uh, and, I, of course, I'm not talking about labels that are encouraging or uplifting. There are those that are out there as well. But for the greater majority or for the greater part, I'm talking about labels that are false. They're degrading, they are damaging, and they are limiting. Let me say that again. They are false, they are degrading, they are damaging, and they are limiting. And sometimes all of the above at the same time. A, a label by definition is this. And of course we know we have labels on cans and such. This is a far different label here. It is a classifying phrase or name applied to a person or thing, especially one that is what? That is inaccurate or is restrictive. How many has ever been told something and it kept you from being prosperous? It kept you from uh, uh, attaining a goal or it kept you, you know, from from really going out for the ball team or whatever it may be. And so a label can be restrictive and it can be inaccurate. As the definition says, labels are usually negative in nature. They are names that are tied to ideas about a person. And they try to define who that person is and even what they'll become. Church, we don't have to be, we don't have to fall in that place. We don't have to fall into those entrapments. If allowed, a label can depress, it can oppress, and it can even destroy a person's life. We see it now in a different sense in the social media scene 
where there's uh, what is it? Cyberbullying, I think, is the proper name for it, and, and, and kids are just pounded on. I mean, those people are waiting to pounce on somebody. You stick something on Facebook, you stick, stick something on Twitter or Snapchat or whatever, and people, you know, uh, people got their opinions, and, and and so many times people think if they, uh, you know, can blast somebody, it just makes their day. Oh, I look for a time. When we're more uplifted than running people down and discouraging people and, and, and saying things that we shouldn't. But if a person allows it can depress, oppress, and even destroy a person's life. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the label of being unworthy. Unworthy. You ever felt unworthy? Unworthy. The, the song says, and we sang it here just the other day, I'm too unworthy, Lord, to come to you. Would you please come down to me? But Hemi understands that type of unworthy is, is, is a right type of mindset. To know that you are a sinner, but know that you have a God, my God, my God, who has the answer. To know that you're a sinner, to know that you're unworthy of anything that God could offer, but know at the same time that His Word is true. That all of His promises are yes and amen. How, that we can count on God. Hallelujah. When we can't count on anything else, when we can't count on our family, we can't count on our job, we can't count on uh, the media, my goodness. We can't count on anything. We can count on God and what He says in His Word each and every time. Unworthy by definition means not deserving effort. Like I don't want to spend any time on you. Not deserving effort, attention, or respect. Let me understand sometimes a child can get in this place to when you know, the parent doesn't spend time with them. Or, hey, Dad, hey, Mom, and, and I, I'm busy right now. I'm busy right now, and it's continual over. And, we've all done it. But there's times that we have to slow down and say, man, this is, this is more important right now. So not deser deserving effort, attention, or respect. It also means having little value or merit. Having little value or merit, unworthy. One of the labels that Satan loves to place on people, especially believers, is the label of being unworthy. Because if there's one thing that we want to be, we want to be loved. And we want to be accepted. We don't like to be rejected. That's why a lot of youth will get involved in gangs. Because they want to be accepted. Because maybe they grew up in a household to where they, you know, that, that respect wasn't shown or, or that attention wasn't given or, or, or whatever the fact. And so they're reaching out to somewhere where they think that they can get it. So from a young age, Satan will use people, he'll use situations, he'll use decisions, and he'll use thoughts to war against a person's self worth. We all can reach back in the treasure chest of our past, we could all reach back and pull out things to where we felt like we was unworthy. We can, feel, uh, we can see places where we uh, didn't feel respected or we didn't have the attention or we didn't feel like anybody wanted to put any effort forth on us. And definitely the enemy starts on us young. And how many knows the devil's only one dude, but he has a whole lot of imps. Has a whole lot of demons. Devil can't be, he's not omnipresent like God. He can't be everywhere at the same time. But he has enough in his arsenal that yes, he will try to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He'll try to fleece you. He'll try to uh, influence you even from a young age. These ones that grow up and uh, they grow up and they become terrorists and terrorist networks of things just placed in their mind and in their lives by the enemy to try to draw them into certain things. Starts in a young place. We're created in the likeness and the image of God. And let me tell you, Satan wants to destroy that image. 
Satan wants to destroy the image of God. He hates it. It's like he looks in that mirror at you and he sees you, he sees God, and he wants to throw something and break it. He wants to destroy that image. And plainly speaking, he wants to completely destroy us and take our lives. How many knows that's not just that's that's not just a play on words there? It's not just something simple. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. You know, I thought about you know some of these things that's went on in in the political world, and you know some, and not only the political world, but other things as well that are going on. And you know, we're all quick to join, jump to conclusion. You hear something, we go, oh, I can't believe he done that. I thought he looked a little shifty. Well, I can't believe that she done that. And we're all quick to jump to conclusion. But I've tried to put myself in that person's place. Whoever's receiving the ridicule, whoever is being come against, and think that, you know, if that person is innocent. I've looked at a lot of lives, and whether they're innocent or whether they're guilty, I've looked at a lot of lives that have been ruined. Because they were just taken through the mud. Their name, their family, all the hurt, all the shame that was there coming from the enemy. He wants to steal, kill, and to destroy us. The world in which we live defines worth by what you have, by what family you come from, and by a person's looks for the most part. If you narrow down, you know, the most of the things that most of the percentage of the hundred percent, it, it narrows down to those things. What you have, what you, what family you come from, and by how you look. I remember in elementary school, you were pretty cool if you had a pair of kangaroo shoes. You remember them? Man had that zipper. Zip, zip. You was, you was stylish. You could put your quarters in that thing if you had some. Hallelujah. You could strut around with them kangaroos and you were somebody. Why was you somebody? You were somebody because of what you had. Amen. That's the way that the world looks at things. And then later you were cool if you had a pair of Reeboks. You know, that phased out. You had a pair of Reeboks or you had a pair of Nikes or Nikes, however you want to uh, uh, name them there. You had a pair of those and then you were just, you were awesome. But a lot of times I've seen if you had a pair of winner's choices. I said if you had a pair of Walmart shoes, which was nothing wrong with at all. You know, I've often said kids can be some of the harshest, cruelest, meanest, despiteful people on the planet. But I remember ones getting run down because they had a pair of winner's choices. Isn't that something? People looking at worth by what you have. And I remember a time myself that there was a, a bike-a-thon that was being offered. This is something that happened to me. A, a bike-a-thon was offered, and, and, uh, and I found out, uh, of course, the bike-a-thon was going to St. Jude's Hospital. And, and how many knows when you're 11, 12 years old, you don't think about all this stuff. But it went to St. Jude's Hospital, and, and, and I heard, though, that if you got the first place prize, you got to pick out a pair of Nike shoes. I said, I'm in. Hallelujah. Now, I had most everything that I wanted growing up, but uh, probably at the time, my mama and daddy couldn't afford to get me a pair of Nike shoes. So if, to my knowledge, I never had a pair of Nike shoes up to that point. I said, I don't know. It's, I haven't slept since then. <laughs> And so I thought, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for this bike-a-thon and I'm going to win. And of course, it had to do with, uh, you know, getting through the mileage. I, I rode all the way to Holly Grove and back on a dirt bike. And I remember going up, man, when we went up, it was in the wind. I mean, the wind was blowing hard. you talking about a little fella with gas. We was all riding together. So mama didn't leave me alone. We was all riding together. And, and we was gas, but on the way back, that wind was to my back. I'd pedal a bit and go, Zzzz. all I could think was Nike shoes, Nike shoes. <laughs> well, lo and behold, I won those Nike shoes. I'll have you know. And I was right proud. And they took my picture. 
I went down to Kern's department store. I don't know if he led me down the high price aisle of shoes or not. But anyway, it was a pair of Nikes that I got. I got brought those home and I put them on. And I remember my first day, it was so awesome at school. Wearing my Nike shoes. But a little bit later, the paper come out. And guess whose picture was on the front page? Little Richie Malone had won the bikeathon and won a brand new pair of Nike shoes. Guess what just happened to my prominent Nike shoes then? They went south. All of a sudden, my proudness and my joy of having Nike shoes was... <laughs> He's got some free Nike shoes. Isn't that something? Isn't that stupid? Isn't that mean? What can happen in, in life? You see, the devil is like that kid that made fun of me on that day. He is looking for and wanting to create an opportunity where he can tear you down. He can make you feel worthless even when you're feeling good. You can go out of the house of God saying, yeah! And then all of a sudden he makes you feel like mud because something that you face or maybe even something that you gave into. He wants to make you feel unworthy. How many has ever felt unworthy to the point that God's not going to forgive me? I don't went too far now. I went too far. But oh, I like what one preacher said. <laughs> and that's helped, helped to hold me in the water some. You see, he said, as long as you want God, He wants you. As long as you want God, He wants you. Hallelujah. Now, I don't go looking for sin, and you shouldn't go looking for sin, but if we do fail, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen? And we don't have to stay in that condemnation. We don't have to stay in that pit, but we can come out of it. Hallelujah. He wants to keep you in a place, church, where you don't value yourself. When he gets you down to a low point, he only wants to chop you down lower. One thing about it, if we listen to a lie long enough, we'll eventually receive it as the truth. You can keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can't keep him from building, but you can keep him from building a nest. He can fly over your head, but you can keep him from building a nest, church. Thoughts can come into your mind, but you don't let the ha you don't have to let them stay. You don't have to say, well, maybe she was right. Maybe I am worthless. You know, there are things that we can think on to better ourselves. I know there's been times that people have told me something and I got a little aggravated. You ever got a little aggravated when somebody told you something? A lot of times you can be told the truth and you get aggravated at it. And then I started thinking about on it, on it and I started praying about it, and I said, you know, Lord, it may be a little bit too that. They might be right. Or I might, not, I might need to take a little inventory on the inside and, and have me knows that I can be promoted in that. But when negativity, how many knows there's a difference between somebody talking to you in love and then somebody making fun about your Nike shoes? Amen? When somebody just wants to tear you down, rather than build you back up. Sometimes we're torn down in love, but we can be built back up. Hallelujah. I encourage you, as children of God, Scripture says that a fool despises instruction. It's foolish to despise instruction. Anybody can teach you. Anybody can teach me. So don't just bite your bottom lip and say, well, you're never going back there. I ain't never listening to that person. Or I hate their guts or whatever. It may, it may be that God is using somebody. And this is off on a side. This is a rabbit trail. Okay. But you may need it. It may be that God's using somebody to sharpen you. To build you up. To strengthen you. 
There's so many lies out there, church, that Satan has put in our past that we couldn't begin to count them all. And it's influenced us in many different ways if we would look back and concentrate on things. We live in a world, especially right now, that we can't tell what the truth is from a lie. It is just amazing. That's why I believe, that's why I love other believers believe that it can't be long because this thing is turning south fast. As the saying say, make you lose your breath. It's turning around so fast. We've been labeled things by people and by our own perceptions, church, all of our lives. And many times it defines who we are or what we would become. But it doesn't have to. Amen? It doesn't have to. You could grow up among drunkenness and alcohol, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't have to define you. You could grow up in an environment filled with drugs, but it doesn't have to define you. It doesn't have to make you that. You could have grown up dirt poor and wonder where the next meal was going to come from. But that doesn't have to define you either. Amen. How many of you can rise above things? You can rise above the labels in life. We don't have to be defined by our past, by Satan or by man. Because a lot of times you don't get truth from those things. But I know one that tells me the truth. What do you think, God? 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, part of that verse. Hallelujah. As Samuel is going to anoint the next king of Israel, and he looks, I think it's Eliab, the eldest son. There he looks at him and he says, man, this is a good looking dude. He's looking sharp. This must be the next king. And then what does God say? He says, no, he, he, I, I've discredited him. I've disallowed him. I, I, that, that's not the one. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that when people cast labels at me, and I don't deserve those labels. I'm so glad that, that I can look to my Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. And I can draw strength from Him. I don't have to receive those things. He knows what the truth is. I, I've heard different ones you know, say, so-and-so come to the Lord. Oh, yeah, man, they're doing good. They're serving God wholeheartedly. I, yeah, right. I just can't hardly believe it. It doesn't matter what people think. It matters what God knows about you and he, and he looks on your heart and he knows where you're at. Man looks on the outward appearance and he looks at the past and Satan tries to drag things up to cause you to be unworthy and to make you fall into the pit. But God looks at your heart. Hallelujah. I'm glad that God doesn't look at us based on the world's standards. God values every human life, get this, the same. The same. I get to think about this. He, he doesn't love, he didn't love Moses anymore and he loved me. Hey. God values every human life the same. Every human life. Hallelujah. There's not one life that is any more valuable to him than another. Color doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. I don't care what we think. I don't care how, as Brother Piker would say, I don't care how pious and holy we get. Well, I'm going to church and I'm doing this and that guy over there, that girl over there is doing it. It doesn't matter what they're doing. God still loves them just as much as he does you. John 3.16 tells us plainly, for God so loved the world that what was he willing to do? Give his only begotten son. 
If that isn't love, as the song says, then heaven's a myth. Hallelujah. That's love, church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, all on an equal plane. I'm called to be a minister, but that doesn't make me better than any lay person or anybody else. Just because I'm not the president doesn't make the president any better than me. I said, God looks at us, and in salvation, we're all on the same plane. And as he looks at me in love, he looks at me with loving eyes. And it doesn't matter what we have gotten into or how ugly we have come by the, become by the world's standards or whatever. And I know the world is going, yes, more toward immorality all the time. But it doesn't matter what we've done or haven't done. He still loves us. And he still all, he loves us all the same. Our unworthiness that we may be experiencing, church, comes from our experiences and how we view ourselves. That's, that's, that's where it comes from. That's, that's the root of things. It comes from our experiences and it comes from how we view ourselves. But God looks past all those things and he sees value and he sees worth. Look at uh, Psalm 139. Many of you know it. Psalm 139 and verse 13. Man, I about have a shout and hallelujah time when I read these verses. Hallelujah. Psalm 139 and verse 13 says, For thou hast possessed my reins, talking to God, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So you get the picture. God was looking down on us even when my mom was with child. He seen little Richie. Amen. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. <clears throat> my substance, or my makeup, my body, all that uh, uh, was attributed to me, my body, my soul, my spirit, my substance was not hid from thee, when I was made in the secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Church, pregnancy and, and birth is, is something. If you study it, you do a, a study on that, you're just like going, wow. God is something else. How's this kid breathing? How's this kid living? I mean... We are curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, down there in our mother's womb, in secret. Thine eyes did see my substance. <laughs> Ain't that something that God was watching you? There's his little thumb. There's a little pinky. My substance, yet being imperfect or not being completely formed, and church, it's a baby. How I many of this is a baby from day one? They can dumb it down. They can water it down with all these words, fetus and embryos and all of this. It's a baby. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet imperfect. And in thy book all my members were written. <laughs> God writing it down. Well, he's got, his, he's got his toes on this day. He's got his eyes on this day or whatever. All my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there were none of them. In other words, he knew when you, he knew your toes was coming on. He knew that your little nose was going to grow or whatever. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O oh God. Imagine the psalmist as he's penning this. How precious are your thoughts unto me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. How often is God thinking about you? If he was looking at little Peggy, so much 
during that time, how much do you think he's kept his eyes on her all of her life? Hallelujah. Great is the sum of those things. I said, God looks at you and he sees value. Even when you were not yet formed, the psalmist says. Church, the world will lie to you. It puts out fake news all the time. You can't make heads or tails of what you hear. But God's word won't lie to you. God's word won't lie to you. It's going to tell you the truth. And sometimes truth hurts. But it also uplifts and strengthens. Worth does not depend on what you have or don't have. Worth does not depend on what somebody else says about you. Your worth is dependent on what you choose to believe. And God says that you are worth more than many sparrows, and he sees them little dudes when they when one falls. Well, there we went Casper. He's probably named them, he's named the stars. He sees a sparrow and he falls, and he says, How much more does he love you and care about you? Hallelujah. God says that you are worth the death of his son. So stop labeling yourself. Stop labeling yourself as worthless at times. I've even had to try to correct myself sometimes. Stupid, 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 stupid. You ever done that? Come on. Boy, that was stupid. And the Holy Ghost kind of jabbed me and say, God don't make no jump. Sorry, Lord. <laughs> we want to beat ourselves up. God says you're worth many sparrows. Hallelujah. Stop beating yourself up and stop receiving what the world says about you and start walking in what God says that you are. Stop walking the way that the world proclaims on you and start, start walking, start believing what God has said from start to finish. Amen? Because your hairs, they're all numbered. And I remember, you know, thinking that that's how many I got on my head. But then I heard one preacher say or somebody say, no, that's what you got on your head and what's all fell out. And I went, you're right. I knew instantly that was right. Because the spirit bore witness is that's what that scripture exactly means. It means the hair that you have on your head, you got, you know, 100,005, I don't know. And he's seen everyone that's ever fell out. How much does he keep up with you? How worthy does he think you are? He gave his son. That's enough. That's enough to know. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your presence that is real in this house. We're thankful for the privilege to stand on your word. Lord, we're living in times right now. Lord, we, we've read about these things <clears throat> in your word. We've heard about these things preached. But Lord, I, I believe we're stepping in to the very final part of these end days. Lord, when deception and deceit and everything is just running so rampant. And Lord, it seems like everything is speeding up towards eternity. Oh, it's, it's, it's scary times, but at the same time, it's, it's exciting. Because I know in whom I have believed. Hallelujah. And I'm like the song, nothing can separate us. Lord, as long as I keep my hand in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus, as long as I believe that Jesus is Lord and there's only one way into heaven, everything's all right. Father, I stand on your word. We stand on your word. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around, just you and God. You're kind of in your prayer closet right now there with yourself. I don't know where you stand with God, whether you've been to church every time the doors are open for years. Going to church doesn't make you saved. So I ask you, as the Holy Spirit is in this place, as the Holy Spirit would bear witness with your spirit, do you know Jesus? If, he was, if God was to say it was your time to take the, your final breath on earth, can you say without a shadow of a doubt, I am saved.
I am born again. If I die right now, I know the blood of Jesus Christ has covered my sins. If you can't say that, I wish you'd raise your hand up and just say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. But if that's you, the Lord's dealing with your heart, you lift your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. Please pray for me. I'm not sure. I think I am, but I'm not sure. Yes. Anybody else, you say, that's me. That's me. That's me. I'm not sure. I want to be sure. I don't want to walk out of this door and somehow meet eternity through an accident or some physical thing or in this day and age, somebody take your life with a weapon. Lord, I don't, I don't want to miss that opportunity. Anybody else, you'd say, that's me. Hallelujah. Could you pray with me? Let's just make it as, in, as one. Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner. I have failed you many times in my life. But right now, I know that you've made me worthy through your son's blood. I stand convicted about my sins, but knowing that you can take them away. Jesus, I ask right now that you come into my heart, that you be my Lord, my Savior, and my very best friend. By faith in what you've done on the cross, how you died and you risen to new life, I accept that. And by my own confession, I am saved according to the word of God in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Maybe you did that and you didn't know the Lord. Tell somebody. Maybe you did that, you recommitted your life back to Him. You once knew the Lord, you once walked with Him, but you started afresh again. Tell somebody, amen. Get anchored, hallelujah. Ain't God good? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sister Angie, you dismiss us in a word of prayer.